Hello and welcome to the Unit 1 podcast on Section 5.2. Here we're going to be discussing uh, the application of the quantum theory that we covered in the last PowerPoint. So here we are. I am Mr. Lin. And I'm Mr. Sakaguchi. And let us begin. So one of the first people to try to apply the quantum theory to the atom was a fellow by the name of Niels Bohr. And so why aren't the atomic spectrums continuous? And this is because of um, the way the electrons are organized. So what we mean by continuous is why don't you see all different kinds of color like a rainbow and why you see certain amounts. So he basically devised a model based upon hydrogen. It's probably the most common model that you're used to. Um, and we'll talk more about features of it that you probably recognize from middle school. It was designed, and there's a lot of math that we're not going to show here, but it basically also explains the emission spectrums for um, hydrogen, how hydrogen bomber lines. Um, also, take into uh, account previously with the Rutherford model, when he came up with his idea of the atom, the electrons had no set location. When Bohr came around and applied quantum theory to it, now the electrons are moving around in discrete orbits, and that was a huge move forward because it gave scientists an idea of where the electrons went. Now that they're moving in tracks, then um, it, it's something to start with. Um, also, I sometimes call this the Bohr ring model, uh, just as a pun, but it helps you remember and distinguish different models from the others. The idea here is that specific, specific energy levels or orbits for electrons were proposed here. So this is also known as the planetary model where like the nucleus is the sun and the electrons are like the planets orbiting. Um, you remember the figure from our last presentation but basically he knew that hydrogen only had certain allowable energy states so he designed um, energy levels to kind of explain this. The lowest energy state was known as the ground state and basically any state above the ground state was known as an excited state. Um, he also related states to the motion of the electron in the atom and believed again as we talked about with the planetary model idea that electrons moved in circular orbits and that the levels were like rungs on a ladder. So uh, recognize that the closer that the rings are to the nucleus they had a different energy level than outer rings. So Bohr theorized that the closer they were to the to the nucleus, the lower their energy content, and then further away, the higher the energy content. That way, when they were excited, they'd go up, and then when they gave off light, they'd come back down to the ground state. One other thing to note is that electrons were only allowed where the dotted lines are. So you couldn't have electrons kind of hang around in these open areas here. This also explains why discrete packages of, of energy could only be seen. The big problem is that it, while Bohr's model perfectly explained hydrogen, it did not work on any other element. And um, one of the reasons why is because there wasn't, the quantum theory was still kind of developing as Bohr tried to apply it. So part of it wasn't his fault. But the idea of energy levels was probably the thing that was the biggest contribution. Uh, rec uh, what happened was uh, other scientists came along, like de Broglie, and they found that the energy levels, while fixed, also kind of fluctuate. They moved around a little bit. So they, instead of having set discrete levels like Bohr's ring model, they started applying it and move it, moved them in a wave-like pattern around an area where, where the electrons could move. So this was the whole reason why we spent so much time explaining waves to you. The idea here is Bohr thought it was a linear path. We actually shown it's, it's a way, uh, sorry, Bohr thought it was a, is a, was a linear path, um, but de Broglie showed that it was a wave-like path. And what you have to remember is that if it's going to be a wave-like path, the, elect, the, the path has to stay in phase. So this explains why Bohr was right about the concept of energy levels because certain distances you can't get full wave cycles in, in sequence like this. And it fixes uh, where 
uh, the different energy levels actually are. So they're still discrete, but there's a little bit more wiggle room. That accounted for all the evidence that they had. And he was also able to show that only particular wavelengths and frequencies were actually possible, which was another important step, but it still wasn't the whole enchilada in terms of, uh, of um, the, the whole picture of what the atom and the electrons were doing. Right. Another fellow who made a, you know, an important contribution is, is Heisenberg. Heisenberg was able to show that for very small particles, we couldn't know the, philosophy, the velocity and the position of, a, of a small particles at the exact same time. And this is because by the time you try to measure the particle, it's already gone due to its um, speed of light velocity. Uh, a way to kind of uh, connect this with things that you may have noticed um, would be something like watching a, I don't know, a hockey match on TV. You don't actually see the puck. If they don't highlight the puck, you don't really see it. You just kind of see a blur, a streak. The faster an object moves, the more you have this uncertainty principle where you're not quite sure how fast it's going, or if you do know how fast it is, then you don't know where it is, just like that hockey puck on, in the rink. Right. So, to kind of make a long story short, they took into account Heisenberg and de Broglie's observations as well as some other important considerations and came up with uh, a new theory. Um, the man who kind of is given credit for putting all this stuff together mathematically is a fellow by the name of Schrodinger. Um, basically, he treated things as waves and he was able to apply his wave equation to other elements and it fit. And this became the basis of the modern model and a lot of what we're going to talk about uh, in the rest of this unit. How Schrodinger made it fit was that he came up with something called wave-particle duality, saying that these electrons behaved as both a wave and a particle at the same time. And with this, uh, by tying in, blah, 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 blah. by tying t together these two concepts, that's how he came to get came up with a t uh, modern quantum mechanical model. So just like light electrons exhibit both properties. And what we find is like a lot of very small particles at this level will do these kinds of things. So one of the things you might want to notice from this, this, this quantum mechanical model for, of the atom, notice how um, there are these things called orbitals which we'll talk a little bit about and notice how they're not circular paths. These actually represent what we call density diagrams. So these are probabilities of finding electrons within certain regions and these colored in areas represent where the probability is highest for particular kinds of, um, of electrons depending upon how far away they are from the nucleus. And we'll talk more about how this all works um, soon. Right. So in this, in this quantum mechanical model to speak in a little bit more detail is that we're not really focusing on the specific path of the electron. Because it's, it's not possible. Right. It's, and so the wave function that um, Schrodinger talked about is basically just a probability of finding electrons in certain areas around the nucleus. And these areas where the probability is greater as 90%, uh, we call these orbitals. Now these are areas where you're most likely to find the electrons, it, and it's not certain that it exactly will be there. but. You don't need to get more specific into the location of that electron. <laughs> getting a phone call, but I'm going to ignore it. Okay. Um, what you see in this figure on the right are with the different shapes of some of the orbitals. Some orbitals are spherically shaped, and other ones have these different unique shapes. So where it's highlighted are probabilities of finding electrons. And notice how where it's brighter is where the probability is highest. And this is just one way to represent orbitals. We'll talk a little bit more about them um, uh, in a little bit. Um, hydrogen's orbitals. Again, for any atomic orbital, this is actually true. Because we're talking about probability, there's no specific end to the orbital. Um, as I said before, it's about a night. Those clouds are based upon 90% probability of finding electron within that within that volume. Um, principal quantum number, which is indicated by an n, and it's always an it's always an integer or a whole number. It indicates the sizes and the energies of the orbitals. And as n gets larger, 
the orbital becomes larger and then also further away from the nucleus. So the uh, principal energy level is the energy level of all the electrons at that, uh, in that location. And n is a whole number that ranges from 1 to 7 for our purposes. And it's going to be a whole number because, like we discussed earlier, with the concept of the quantum as a discrete package, therefore it's also a discrete energy level. So you'll never find a, a decimal for that n number. Um, what we find is, is, is that within each energy level there are sublevels. And so in our next podcast we'll talk about what these things mean. But this is one of the reasons why, why um, Bohr was off with his model. He was right in the sense that there were energy levels, but he thought that the number of electrons that were in each energy level were fixed. And what you see here are the different sublevel types, and each sublevel has different numbers of orbitals within them. And notice how the number of, of uh, electrons that can be held in any sublevel varies from level to level. So again, this is one of the reasons why Bohr... Bohr's model was way off the mark. And we'll talk more about how, while this might look confusing, that there is an, uh, a methodology behind this. Yeah, and you're going to practice um, how to put these sort of uh, sub energy configurations together. So we'll explain how the energy sublevels are arranged. We'll explain the rules for putting electrons in the right place. And then ultimately, you'll be able to um, arrange electrons for any element on the periodic table. And that is it. Yep. Or no, it's not it. <laughs> so these are more um, orbitals. Again, these a lot of these go beyond the scope of the course. Um, some things to note here, notice how the S's get oh, bigger and bigger. Yeah. So all these inner rings represent S's from that are closer to the nucleus. And then you can see the same thing for other parts. But notice that there is a certain pattern to the way it's arranged. Those in the vertical columns all have similar shapes. There's, there's a certain sense to it. And we'll go into more detail on how to read that on the periodic table at a later time. Yeah. Now that's it. Sure? Okay. <laughs>